the Umbrella Corporation's troops are very emotionless stormtroopers. There's that sense of uniformity and conformity. And I would also say that Mila's costume is the least silly looking since the original movie. I mean, let's recap, shall we? The original movie, short red skirt. Good. The second movie, orange undershirt and a net shirt over it. You can kind of see it here. Yeah, not so good. Why I have this? I like Mila Jovovich. A lot. And then the third in this one, she forgets part of her pants legs and part of her sleeves, respectively. This one really worked for her. I didn't personally think that the ponytail whip thing that she sports at the beginning really worked for her. But hey, she's a ninja. How kick-ass is that? Honestly, the entire first action scene is really awesome. The decision to cut the powers and not have her run around with the clones for more than the first 20 minutes of the movie or so probably satisfied a lot of people who didn't like either of those aspects. As far as the clones go, it didn't really get me that excited about a fourth movie when I saw them in the third movie. I mean, I get that some people think this is simple math, you know, one super person is really good, automatically a hundred of them or however many is a hundred times as good, but it's just not that simple. When there is one very powerful being and everyone around is a mere mortal, it really has an effect that this one super being is super. When there's a hundred of them, and it doesn't matter much if any of them die because there are a hundred of them, and they're the exact same, it's just less effective. And that's why I want to say that Anderson handled the clones really well in this. I'm not going to go into detail, but in those first 20 minutes, he uses them well. Not excessively. Almost none of the action in this loses you, really. Now, as for her losing her powers, it is kind of silly how each movie she just gets more and more powerful. And while it both makes sense and disappoints that she now loses them, especially after using them so very little, with that said, there is at least one badass use of them in this. It actually winds up not making that much of an impact. She's still super chick. She can still survive what she really shouldn't be able to. And that's another thing about Anderson. He forgets that having something that's supposed to look really impressive and dangerous happen and no one be hurt by it, for example, takes the effect out of the really impressive thing. Then again, he's not the only current director who does this. Jovovich looks incredibly sexy, as always, although for some reason she does not get naked in this. What gives? Come on, you found a way to write it into the other three. Besides, I can think of at least one scene where it would really have made sense. I don't know, I've never been able to figure out if it's Paul W.S. Anderson showing solidarity and allowing other people to stare at his amazingly hot wife's naked body, or if it's just showing off, like, oh yeah, I totally get to hit that. The acting is okay, I didn't really feel like anyone stood out as being really atrociously bad, but no one really gets anything to work with. I mean, Alice is our protagonist for all four movies, and the closest thing she gets to character development is, I'm getting all of you out of here alive. And that's it. She's still the focus, but Claire gets almost as much screen time once they join up. And while this is still about how badass Alice is, again, the loss of her powers really doesn't affect this all that much. I wish it did, but I think, unfortunately, it's too late at this point. I don't think audiences would accept that she didn't constantly kick ass with ease, because she's been doing it since the first movie. Anyway, Claire actually gets to do something also, take part in the action. As far as the action goes, there is some awkward posing and Anderson has yet to learn that slow motion does not automatically make everything better, like you have to limit your use of it somewhat and you have to make good choices for what you want to slow down. 
I mean, John Woo uses a ton of slow motion, but look at the choices of shots and sequences in slow motion. The characters are also considerably less obnoxious than the first three. Well, the second and the third movie, more like. The first one really didn't have any obnoxious ones, and this one doesn't either. Unfortunately, they also don't stand out all that much. And we, of course, don't care what happens to them, because they just barely have names, much less personalities. Michael Schofield joins the fray, scowling worse than he did on Prison Break, and I actually like Prison Break, and liked his performance on there. He's given nothing to do in this. I mean, look back over his career. He was in that show Popular once. Yes, I watched that. And even there, he just exudes this coolness. If you don't make him overdo it, he can be cool almost just by being there. Here, he's made to try too hard. Then there's the fact that Wesker talks and moves basically like Agent Smith, and that's not even the only thing they get very clearly and very directly from the Matrix trilogy. You may have seen in the trailer that shot that's just like Trinity. That actually does make more sense in this movie, though. Oh, and Sienna Gillory, I hope I didn't butcher that name completely, as Jill only has a cameo. As you may remember, Extinction was basically one long setup to this movie. Does it live up to that? Not story-wise. I mean, they follow up on the ending, but a lot of people are going to be disappointed with how they do that. And like Extinction, it has so little plot and so little of importance actually happens that both of these two movies could be removed from the franchise and there'd almost be nothing changed. I mean, the first two actually did have plots. Not very good ones, especially Apocalypse, which was essentially a cliché, a MacGuffin, but they did have plots. I'd say about half the one-liners work and the other half were just bad or embarrassing. Now, I watched this in 3D and if you want to watch it, I definitely suggest you watch it in 3D as well. It is indeed apparently shot with the same technology as Avatar. And while, of course, nowhere near as visually stunning as that film, it is very attractive 3D. With one or two exceptions, it isn't used excessively. It just adds that extra layer, that extra dimension, visually speaking. The CGI tend to be pretty good. The humor is okay. This did get several unintended laughs as well. To actually use the word atmosphere in relation to this movie would be going over the top, but it certainly does have some genuine tension. And the jump scares tend to work very well. It's also nice that this goes for an R rating. There is blood and violence in this movie. Not really gore, they don't go quite that far but blood and violence, because you can't make a zombie movie without it. It makes it not be a zombie movie. They also swear where it feels natural. It's not excessive like some of what was in Apocalypse. I've heard that this is the most game-based of all four movies. I don't know. I've barely played any of the games. With this whole film series, the whole zombie thing is way too apt a metaphor. As far as plot, characters, dialogue, and sometimes even drama go, these films are dead. And yet they just stumble around more or less aimlessly, albeit with a certain determination to their one goal, which is to devour the brains of anyone it comes into contact. And you can make a joke out of all three sequel subtitles, Resident Evil Apocalypse, because a movie that bad is a sign of the coming end of the world, Resident Evil Extinction because there is no longer any sign of a story, and Resident Evil Afterlife because the series is probably dead by now, but it just kind of keeps going. Anyway, all in all, if you know it's going to be dumb, if you liked at least one of the other movies, you don't need to have watched them all because, like I said, it's so simplistic, you can follow it. If you're a very forgiving fan of one of the games, 
or if you just want something big, dumb, and loud that really doesn't ask you to think at all for 90 minutes, I recommend it, and I definitely recommend it in 3D. That was my spoiler-free review of Resident Evil Afterlife in 3D. I hope you enjoyed it. I will see you next time.